Hi. What's up? Hi, sweeties and others. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm trying something new. Okay. <laughs> how, do, how are we feeling about that? Too familiar? <laughs> you know what? You're right. I'll, I'll put that. I'll put that one. I'll put that one aside. We'll we'll work on it. <laughs> how are you doing, dorks and geeks? <laughs> that one. That one's a good good fallback, right? Yeah, I feel like so. This is the third and final episode of Three Lilies and Their Ghost Stories. Probably due to reasons, the first one in chronological order that we've recorded that we've recorded successfully. But it'll be the final one. Uh, but it'll be the final one. Uh, we've I, been I'm having sure, some. Uh, we'll, we've been having some software problems. I'm sure I've told you the entire story already during EP one, <laughs> so I won't. I won't bore you again now. But nonetheless, let's uh, let's go ahead and start with the third and final story, the city. I'm gonna get. Some. Oh, I didn't know this was. I didn't know this was. Uh, influenced by a strapping young lad. Yo, strapping young lad, fuck. <laughs> I fucking love strapping young lad. Lily of the city. Happiness is the smell of sin. The year 2030X in XX Aqua City, Atlantic Ocean. A desire for visibility. Realization one is invisible. The pain of being hidden. The pain of being nothing. Feeling of becoming a statistic. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm I'm ready for, for fun. I also get to narrate this one. Yay! Yay! Ah, shit, I dropped my mic in the water again. Hold on. <laughs> the last rays of the sun began to sputter and die over the Atlantic Ocean. Orange and red refractions scattered, traveling up until they reached an unnatural stopping point. Large, imposing, circular, gray, green, and yellow, it floated in the water, but it did not ebb and flow with it. Gray, green, and yellow, isn't that a Baroness album? So... They have an album <laughs> called Yellow and Green, and they have an album called A Gray Sigh and a Flower Husk. Yeah. So. So, yes. I guess. <clears throat> I guess? If you want to be weird about it, sure. <laughs> Throughout the millions of years of Earth's history, she had never seen an island of this size appearing in less than a year. That island, Aqua City XX, with hollowed out columns jutting from the top and a cone shaped underbelly with air pockets, was not the only one of its kind. This was one of the many islands that were developed for the sake of people who lost their homes on real land, taken by the very ocean they floated atop. It did not come as a surprise to anyone. For quite some time now, humanity had anxiously waited for the carnage to begin. As soon as Antarctica's ice shelf deterioration began speeding up, tech companies rushed to complete their engineering masterpieces and enter into profitable contracts with governments around the globe. Only half a year later, the winner of that race was decided, and so came the floating islands in droves. <sighs> the last beam finally died. The light of the sun was replaced with the artificial stars on the island. In the highest skyscraper on the very top floor, the light shining through the windows danced and flit around. And this building in particular was inhabited by both the island's direction committee and the wealthiest residents, the winners of the numerous auctioned floors. The top floor, of course, was a penthouse belonging to the island's director. That night, much like any other night, he hosted a party to strengthen his connection. Some flew in from elsewhere, whether that be natural land or reclaimed land, but most were the same wealthy socialites and venture capitalists that had always lived on the island. The director of island operations stood on a balcony, taking a microphone the size of his palm from one of his secretaries. <clears throat> uh, good evening, my dear friends. His voice was flawlessly projected from every corner of the room using wireless technology, as if he were right next to everyone present. How are y'all enjoying everything tonight? Various cheerful responses resounded throughout the penthouse. <laughs> well, that's just great. But I have a surprise for you all. Tonight, we teamed up with a 3D printing company from Canada to make your refreshments. The guests rat gasped in astonishment. As the director continued speaking, he waved his arms around in large gestures. 
That's right, every single food item in this room printed using their incredible technique. If you haven't felt it already gazing out at the beautiful ocean, then let me help it hit ya. You're living in the future, now. This is what humanity is capable of. No matter what happens, we're gonna make it through this. Ha <laughs> ha. The room erupted into hopeful cheers. Underneath this sleepless city lied another. Very uniform without a hint of vegetation, it gradually whittled into a conical shape ending with a nuclear power plant and its waste. About 45% of the outer ring of this cone was dedicated to dormitories. The remaining percentage went to facilities that helped the island function on its own for long periods, such as underground farms, waste disposal, and the power plant. Day in and day out, the workers that lived in this underwater city carried out their jobs with relatively few breaks. In exchange, they got a place to stay, a small hourly wage and special Aqua City currency tokens, discounted amenities, and free food. They were free to visit the city on top, but many of the goods sold in the stores there were often too expensive for their tiny salary. The inhabitants had a nickname for the wildly different halves. The city that always tasted the air of the sea was the above. The city where workers were expected to spend the rest of their lives was the under. I mean, I don't see how this could go wrong. <laughs> Every single sci-fi dystopia novel I've ever read has prepared me to believe that this will work out perfectly fine. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just like in that documentary, Bioshock. <laughs> Two plant workers on their break, Tara and Anzu, sat in their dorm. Are you telling me a plant did this work? I, okay. So we're going to, this is what we're doing. We're doing this now. We're, we're, we're okay. From Britain came Tara, a Gujarati woman, and from France came Anzu, a Japanese woman. London was becoming nigh uninhabitable, plagued by frequent flooding and heat waves. Marseille was no different. We're gonna Is that wrong? Marseille? I feel like I feel like we're right this time. What? I don't want another Batale situation here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> Am I overthinking my French pronunciation here? <laughs> The two were randomly assigned as roommates and, unexpectedly, found themselves growing so close they ended up getting together. On a small television embedded in their wall, an English-language news channel ran depressing story after depressing story. They zoned out as another segment concerning the ice shelf ran. The scientists predict that another large piece will soon break off and make even more cities barely habitable. The CEO of Devera Tech, Eric Chamberlain, recently announced a new series of floating cities in the wake of this study. Known as the Second Noah, Chamberlain. All right, so last time I was Anzu, but given what we know about how these characters divide up later, would you like to take <clears throat> Anzu instead? I can do that if you'd prefer. Yeah, just thinking ahead to like the <clears throat> later scenes. So that way we do as less talking to ourselves as. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, shut up! Shut up! Anzu slammed the touchscreen remote with her foot. This changed the channel to a multilingual children's programming. Nobody even calls him that. <laughs> his PR team does. I wouldn't care if his PR team called him Ass Noodles. He can go to hell. <laughs> Putting ass in front of an unrelated world will never not be funny. <laughs> That's timeless humor right there. <laughs> Anzu flopped down on the bed next to Tara. Tara rolled over to snuggle close to her. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it'll be fine time for us to go up uh, in for the refueling soon? Who knows? They planned this horribly. How did they expect us to complete it on schedule when we're so poorly trained? There are only three people who've actually had prior experience at a nuclear plant, and two of them are on another island right now. I can't believe they'd rather put us on odd jobs and janitor duty than keep our skills sharp. Hey, if we also double as a lot of other things, then that saves them more money, right? <laughs> Pricks. The two stared at the metal ceiling and listened to the hum of the heater. Tara's eyes eventually began to dart around, glancing at everything from Anzu's lighter and cigarettes to Tara's own Lord Ganesha statue on their little desk. <sighs> I've heard living on coasts was becoming so dangerous that real estate companies were getting rid of properties for nothing. Cheap to live there, but they raised the value of safer properties to recoup costs, so... Now all the poorer folk in risky places are even more stuck. 
Lots of countries have been moving their port capitals. <sighs> I wonder what life was like for people who were born before all this happened. We've only known this crazy world, right? Sorry, I shouldn't have put on that news channel. It's fine. We've already watched all the three films they gave us anyway. <laughs> hey, do you know what Venice was? <laughs> I, may, maybe Venice will be fine. They're used to boats. Maybe I they mean, just move all the other shit on I the boats. Mean, yeah, like, I feel like that's going to be next on the the list of areas that are going to get the seawalls. <laughs> or, or just like, they, they boat between the buildings already. They just put the buildings on the boats. Dude, there boat was a... Um, so there's a great um, near-future speculative fiction novel uh, by Kim Stanley Robinson. Which uh, I still need to read. Yeah, I think it's New York 2140, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And it's about New York in about, in about a century or so with uh, that much flooding from global warming. And yeah, basically they do just like canal between buildings in, the, in that. And it's really interesting how, how that all works out. I've fucking sold people on reading this novel, and I've never read it or any other KSR novel in my life. <laughs> oh, really? You? I'm a fraud. If you if you like hard science fiction, I would heavily recommend um, Ken Stanley Robinson's Green Earth trilogy. Yeah, I know I like them. Yeah, they, I just suck at doing things that I want to do. I mean, yeah, that's fair. I mean, if I, I I'm, <laughs> I'm saying this like it's a victory. Do you know how hard it is to read a book? <laughs> Anzu sat up and observed Terra's face with concern. I've never seen you so sad. It's unusual. Come on, cheer up. Kieran's coming today, isn't she? Aren't you happy she got lucky enough to get the last residence slot on the above? She'll have a much better time here than constantly flooding London. Before Anzu was Kieran. She was Terra's dear childhood friend, who Terra mustered up the strength to confess to before she left the British Isles for the floating city. Because of their long-distance relationship, Kieran had no problem letting Tara occupy herself with others, so long as Kieran was able to chat with them somehow, too. She trusted Tara. Even if Tara were to eventually consider Anzu an irreplaceable staple in her life and not just a momentary lover, Kieran was certain that change would never break their bond. And it was true. Tara, for the longest time, couldn't help but feel guilty that she didn't stick with Kieran until they absolutely could not stay any longer. However, that wasn't why she was frowning. Yeah, I am. What a nice smile. Much better. Anzu scooted over to Tara and nuzzled her cheek. You have to make the nuzzle noise. What's the nuzzle noise? I don't know. I just make cute cuddle noises whenever they cuddle. Mm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see how cute Kieran is in person. <laughs> She's adorable. Call her mom P and she'll literally crumple. Mom P? It's like a childhood nickname. Uh, she's Bengali. It's a rather common thing. Very embarrassing to hear, though. I repeated it when I heard her mom call her that, and she lay down on the sidewalk and wouldn't move. <laughs> that was the first time we met, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello there. This is too much social contact for me. I'm just gonna... <laughs> I'm just gonna lay here on the sidewalk face down until you go away. <laughs> it works. And she decided to be your friend after that? I would have declared you as my sworn enemy. Eh, same difference. <laughs> Kieran doesn't really hold grudges, uh, I hope. You'd better. I'll use it a few weeks after she settles in anyways. I don't want to imagine how quickly she'll collapse with the stress of mom pee on top of everything else. I can't begin to grasp how nerve-wracking it must have been, hoping she'd get that slot. Yeah. Anzu huffed. I can't stand people who took the direction committee's stupid gift. You mean the priority coupons, right? I don't use that flowery feel-good name. I call them what they are. Rigging passes. Yeah, I guess you're right. Every possible property ownership on the above was subject to chance and luck. The nicer apartments near the center were auctioned off, but the rest were granted via lottery. The United Nations required Deveratech to offer a certain amount of apartments to anyone for free, but the company negotiated a way to keep things orderly in the form of a lottery. And as we all know from every single piece of sci-fi or speculative fiction uh, involving a lottery, uh, that could never go wrong. Yeah. 
I read the first two thirds of of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, and I and things turned out fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see what the big problem yeah, I wonder is. What, I wonder what happens to the rest of that. <laughs> it's, uh, you can infer it, I'm sure. <laughs> Anyone could apply for residency, but there wasn't a guarantee that you'd get that spot. You were randomly selected. If you weren't, then that was too bad. The news dubbed it the Survivor Lottery. No human was overlooking this process. Everything was automated. The computer did not care whether you were simply curious, securing your rocky-looking future, or were in dire need of a place to stay. There was only one little-known way to ensure your spot. All you needed was someone who worked under. Everyone under got one priority coupon to fill one residency with a lottery entrant of their choice. All coupons were valid until the residences were filled. If you missed your chance after that, well, you could always hope a resident dies before your plus one. The floating piers jutting from the city were lit by rows of lights. For a moment, there weren't many vessels anchored to those piers. Most of the visitors for the director's party preferred to use helipads scattered throughout the city. A single hydrocopter descended. A few minutes after it landed, a woman popped out with two pieces of luggage. As soon as she walked a fair distance from the hydrocopter, the pilot gave her a thumbs up and soared away. She brushed her long hair back as the ocean winds blew it around. It smells strange out here. Like someone sprayed cheap floral perfume over the ocean. I love her expressions. They're very good. <laughs> the woman walked down the pier and into the city. Following a map on an application she was instructed to download before arriving. She followed it until she reached a humble apartment building near the outer edges. It was nothing extravagant like the buildings further inside. It almost reminded her of an old apartment building, albeit with more contemporary architecture. Is this where I live? The woman pocketed the phone. But if I want to visit Tara, I have to go down, don't I? As if trying to find her girlfriend with x-ray vision, she stared intensely at the ground. How do I do that? Maybe I should put my things away first. Suddenly, her shadow disappeared. The light that was shining down on her was gone. Hmm. When she looked up, it was back on. And then, it flickered until it went out again. This time, it didn't come back on. In the reactor control room at the bottom of the island, five operators were on shift. Something caught one's attention. Uh, what's wrong? The operator pointed at a screen, his finger on a camera displaying a spent fuel pool. Two maintenance workers had already taken spent fuel assemblies out of the small modular reactors and lowered them into the pool for the first ever refueling on the island. At that time, they were preoccupied with slotting in the new fuel assemblies. Only the operators were paying attention to the pool. Uh, what's that thing over there in reactor 4? Also, how can we still toward NAS? Ah, <laughs> uh, don't tell me how the one who sees that, right? What are you talking about? She trailed off when she noticed an unusual glow coming from what should have been inactive rods. It would shine incredibly brightly at first, then dim, then shine and dim repetitively. What? That? I have no idea. Hey, look! Everyone turned their attention to another operator. He was sweating profusely as his finger pointer, pointer finger even, moved from screen to screen. It's happening in every stent fuel pool we got fuel in. Oh, what the hell? Suddenly, several cameras went out at once. Visual confirmation of what maintenance was doing in Reactor 4 was now impossible. The temperatures in Reactor 4 started to rise, setting off an alarm. I call the maintenance back. This is just bizarre. The operator glanced to the head operator for approval. Uh, do it. He turned on the multi-purpose device affixed to his shirt. Uh, this is control. You need to get out of there right- Help! Please! Help! The worker's voice was unusually crackly, a quality someone would expect from an antique walkie-talkie. Oh, uh, what's wrong, buddy? At that moment, the lights in the room began to flicker aggressively. I don't! It's I- Everyone in the room heard the worker fall to the ground. One person frantically tried to turn the cameras back on, to no avail. Dragging sounds could be heard from the device. 
stop, stop, please, let me go, I'm sorry, I'm... As communications cut off, the lights in the operating room completely stopped functioning. In exchange, all of the cameras came back on. There, the operators in the room saw... Well, that sounds fine. <laughs> a miserable wail reverberated throughout the under. What was that? What the? The island's power abruptly turned off. Every single light on the island blinked out within moments. Eek? Huh? The once well-lit penthouse. <laughs> Why did I question it? <laughs> um, should I be scared now? <laughs> The once well-lit penthouse was shrouded in darkness, frightening the guests. Confused, they muttered and gossiped. Someone dropped their champagne flute, shattering it. The director stormed up to a guard and grabbed him by the collar. Hey, now, what's going on here? Uh, we're not sure, sir. The team in the engine room never alerted us to anything. You heard nothing at all now. You're positive. Yes, sir. <sighs> After examining the guard's expression, the director released his collar and cursed under his breath. Ah, <sighs> shit. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he looked out over the sea of wealthy guests. Paranoid thoughts ran through his mind, while his smile and composure were well practiced. Brewing within him was a storm of distrust and fear. He ran a hand along his jacket, searching for something. When he found the familiar bump he was looking for, he returned his attention to the guard. Do me a favor now, have everyone wait for my signal, but don't act like something's wrong. I'm heading down there myself. All by yourself. Shh. Shut the fuck up. Sorry, it's just... <sighs> it's dangerous. Oh. It's Sorry. dangerous. We don't know what's going on. Could be a bad actor. Could be a malfunction. They're changing out the fuel for the first time, so it could be related to that. I get it. But if people start suspecting foul play because there's guys in uniform with guns crawling all over the place, then this island looks unsafe. That won't reflect well on Deveratech. And you can say goodbye to all of our biggest cash cows the exchange rate of the island currency, and my boss's fucking shareholders. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Should we contact the director of energy? The director flinched at the suggestion. Don't bother. That bitch will just report this, and it'll be Armageddon. Yes, sir. Satisfied, the director returned to the edge of the balcony. He had no trouble raising his voice enough for it to carry throughout the room. Everyone, everyone, there's no need to panic. I have a feeling I know what's going on here. There's a new operator in town, probably hit the big red button. Either that or someone dropped their lunch into a turbine. <laughs> the guests laughed. Some of their discomfort alleviated. I'm going to personally see what's going on. I'll be back up here in just a few hours. Good luck, my guy. Have fun cleaning up some guy's meal in a can. <laughs> Can I get my meals in a can? <laughs> or just the printer? <laughs> Anzu sat on the edge of the bed nervously. It's been a while. Do you think it's going to turn back on anytime soon? Terra? With their vision so limited, Anzu could only hear Terra fumbling around with what sounded like clothing. The plastic rustle of a coat and the zip of a zipper were familiar. Anzu then realized that Terra was putting on a fresh plant maintenance uniform. Hey, what are you doing? I'm heading down to see what's wrong. Huh? Why? Tara adjusted the jacket with a huff. Because I'm mad. Kieran should be here by now, meaning that on her first day here, she has to deal with this weird blackout. And she deserves only the best. Well, if you're that determined, I guess I've got no choice. Anzu got up to grab her own uniform. It wouldn't hurt either. Imagine if we saved the whole island from blowing up. Blow up? <laughs> I can't do a good sonic voice. <laughs> oh, do you think we'll get a fancy apartment above or something? They'll give us that and two years worth of food, and it'll be the good stuff, not the weird enriched stuff they make down here. <laughs> Splendid. Let's go. The director approached an emergency stairwell leading to the under. One guard flanked his left to help with crowd control. People who were outside when the blackout occurred gawked at him. Stand aside. Let the man in. One woman walked past the crowd and towards the director. Hey. Excuse me. 
Now what is it, young lady? You're going to the city below this one, right? I want to come with. There are people I want to see down there. The director hesitated. If he made it seem as if she couldn't come down because it was dangerous, rumors could spread. Not only would that impact Deveratech as he feared, but more friends and relatives of the workers below might want to make their way to the under. And who are you exactly? The woman showed him her resident identification card. The director remembered her for one reason only and merely because he found it amusing at the time. Oh, you're the one who took the last slot, huh? How hilarious it was to imagine all the poor suckers who missed their chance because of some random woman. I'll take you down to the first basement floor and that's as far as you'll follow. You're on your own finding your friends after that. She nodded. The hatch was opened and the two disappeared. <sighs> Come on! Tara finally gave up trying to make an elevator work and threw up her hands in exasperation. Nothing is working? You would think whatever backup reserve that's powering these emergency lights would power the elevator too. <sighs> maybe an elevator this size eats up too much electricity? Or maybe the engineers who designed these islands just added the wind turbines and solar panels for decoration. Remember how tech companies raced to answer the United Nations plea for help? And some experts were concerned about the speed of their press releases and prototype drops? All the higher-ups must have thought about was money. <sighs> I didn't want to say it, but I think you're right. That's really depressing to think about, isn't it? The panels and turbines really do generate power. We've just been having still days with no sunlight. Someone's deep voice came from an adjacent hallway. Two pairs of footsteps approached the girls. They were only able to see who the one who spoke when he came close enough. Tara shrank back. It's the director. What is he doing here? The Aqua Cities are designed with a wide variety of power sources for the grid and mine, though nuclear is the primary source. The nuclear reactors, of course, are designed in such a way that changing out spent fuel doesn't require much time at all, and we can do it one by one very quickly. Tara twitched. That's not true at all. Anyway, there should be some power. There should be power stored at all times, even if nothing is running. The island can operate for days. Oh, then what's going on right now, then? Nothing's lit up except for emergency lights. The director glared at Anzu. What is going on is that the people responsible for this haven't been doing their jobs properly. Speaking of the people responsible for this, where are, what are you two doing? Getting down there to solve the problem, I hope. As a matter of fact, sir, we are. And if you had to ask me, this was inevitable. The committee here did a shit job of prioritizing the energy sector. Tara grabbed Anzu's shoulder the moment she realized he was behind the director. Anzu... What? The person Tara was looking at stepped out into the faint underwater moonlight. Aren't you Kieran? Aren't you Anzu? And is that Tara? Kieran cautiously came closer, squinting to see. Are these two women the ones you wanted to see? She nodded. Kieran faced Tara and held her arms out for a hug. Hmm? <laughs> I'm sorry, Kieran. The hugs will have to wait. Hmm. We have to hurry and find out what's going- Oh, don't make that face at me. <laughs> you can see I'm already dressed for this, right? You, under <laughs> you understand it's not like that, right? <laughs> right? We have to hurry out and find out what's going on. Kieran put her arms down. Okay, I'll come with. N no! no! Anzu and Tara both held their hands out as if they needed to physically stop Kieran. Why not? It's not safe for someone who isn't trained to go down to the plant. You can wait in our room, all right? No. I just got here. I want to be with you. Kieran? I don't see a problem with it. There shouldn't be anything horribly dangerously wrong at all. This is just a little mystery that we all have to solve. Isn't that right? Director, this isn't the time for public relations. And what do you mean, public relation? You act like you know what's going on is dangerous. Hmm. <laughs> well now, do you? No, we don't, sir. Tara quickly cut into spare Anzu in further embarrassment. That's why we're going down, Director. I thought this was obvious. I'm sorry if it seemed otherwise. We're off the clock before this, after all. That's why we're all the way up here on the floor we live in. At first, the director didn't respond. He almost looked like he was about to pounce. Why is he looking at us like we did it? I have a bad feeling about this. Suddenly, his expression eased up. 
You're right. It was obvious. Let us go. Ah. Uh. Anzu and the director headed further on into the under to reach the large emergency stairwell in the center. Tara took Kieran's hand. Kieran, we'll have to use the stairwell the whole way down, all right? You can still back out if you want. Nobody will judge you. It's okay. I can do this. All right. Follow me and watch your step, okay? The monotonous clanging sound of feet walking down metal steps reverberated throughout the stairwell. Ah. <sighs> Everyone had been walking for about 20 minutes now. Anzu kept sneaking glances at the director's face, waiting for him to start whining. At last, someone broke the silence, but it wasn't the director. My legs hurt. I warned you. Despite the complaints, nobody stopped. Why don't I tell a few stories while we're heading down? Like? Like ghost stories. Anzu jolted. I don't think we need to... I want to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, here goes. This one is from China. Way back in the 90s, a mysterious ghost woman lived in an abandoned village. Please don't. Anzu's please were ignored. Like that one village, Hotowan? Yeah, like Hotowan, but it wasn't Hotowan. It wasn't even the same island. Anyways, one day a woman on the side of the living found this village and quickly discovered that she couldn't escape. Tara. Tara laughed. All right, all right. Then how about this one from America back before it broke up? Does it have clowns? No, no clowns. Chainsaw murders? Have you any real clue what a ghost story is, Karen? I know what a ghost story is, but you said it's from America. Yeah, but... <clears throat> they actually made a movie based off of this one. There was once a neighborhood that nobody could escape from. It's just another one with no escape. Anzu whimpered. You three sure are having fun during an emergency, aren't you? The air in the stairwell immediately turned icy. A pit of regret formed in Tara's stomach. Don't forget the problem at hand. Treating a situation like this so lightly is how you get sloppy, ladies. We're not even near the plant yet, you twit. I have a question that's been nagging at me, director. Anzu's voice was laced with acid. Oh, no. How do we know that this isn't something the electricians should be handling? After all, you said it yourself, the grid should always have energy in its reserves. Doesn't a total blackout indicate that this is an issue with how that energy is delivered? The director hesitated. The Director of Energy told me that she believes this blackout has something to do with the reactor. Anzu hummed with dissatisfaction and suspicion, but didn't press it, much to Tara's relief. And why isn't the Director of Energy here? The trek continued in uneasy silence. At some point, the air seemed to change. Anzu and Tara recognized it as the pressure rising as they neared the bottom. Kieran whimpered as her ears popped. The echo of that whimper made Tara stop. Wait. What? Listen. Everybody came to a complete stop. Nothing could be heard. There was only silence. The turbines aren't running at all? Creepy. And you'd think we'd see someone by now. I'm starting to get really worried. Well, just standing around here won't make you feel any better now, will it? Let's go. The director continued walking. Ah. Uh. At last, they reached the lowest ring of the under. The feeling of walking on a flat floor after a long period of going downstairs briefly disoriented everyone. They took a ten minute break to recuperate before moving on. Anzu and the director regained their bearings and headed out, while Tara and helped a still exhausted Kieran collect herself. There's another flight after this, Kieran. Brace yourself. Ooh. You. <laughs> <laughs> Tara took her hand and began to lead her to the last stairwell. Aren't there supposed to be, like, security guards on patrol here? Tara? Huh? Oh, sorry, Kieran. It was miles away for a moment there. Uh, let's go. They went downstairs. 
Nobody. They passed through the locker room. Nobody. Anzu and the director teamed up to manually open the door to the control room. This place is completely trashed. Where is everyone? Shit, this is bad. Anzu immediately ran to take stock of the room while the director loitered around a control panel. Tara hugged Kieran in, in gently, looking around in disbelief. Something awful must have happened. Tara let go of Kieran and approached Anzu as the other was riding a chair. Anzu leaned in to whisper to her. Hey, Tara. Do you think this has anything to do with that wailing we heard? I'm not sure. What are you two now whispering about over there? The director snapped at them, his hand against the chassis of a touchscreen control panel. Kieran was standing next to him. Hurry up and come here. The control should still work. After all, that's what the backup generator is for. Tara and Anzu glanced at each other before obeying the director's command. Anzu turned on a flashlight on her multi-purpose device and activated one of the displays. The faint sounds of computer parts operating could be heard. Oh, they really do. She turned on a few cameras. Cameras, too. She continued to turn on various feeds, but found that some of them just wouldn't turn on. Can't look at anything actually important. There are no visuals for the pools or the SMRs themselves. All of the screens flickered unusually. Suddenly, two cameras blinked out. Anzu quickly toggled the settings until only one camera was on. And I think having too many on at one time might be a drain. Isn't it nice that the worker ants will always have a way to do their job? Anzu glanced at the director. It wasn't my idea. You can quit it with your sarcastic comments. I've had quite enough of them. Don't forget, I am your boss. Tara winced. Yes, sir. Understood. Anzu, quit pushing it. Wish the director made her as uneasy as he makes me. Anzu fiddled with a couple of other displays. She didn't know what any of the displayed information meant, but as far as she could tell, there weren't any red light alerts, only greens and yellows. This is going to be hard without any operators. I have no idea what any of this says. The other half of the team is still helping out with the labor shortage at that other island, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Thinking about operating this thing ourselves scares me, though. Where's the director of energy? She knows the ins and outs of everything and has qualifications in spades. She should be able to guide us. The director scoffed. We don't need her now. She would have come if we needed her, wouldn't she? It really shouldn't be that hard. Don't try to chicken out on me. Even a baby could do it. Deveratech has made all the complication a thing of the past. The grid could come online within minutes. Tara noticed that the director was mostly facing Kieran as he spoke. Except it's not that easy. Quicker startup and better automatic detection don't mean we have to pay less attention to those things. The stupid alternate power sources need human monitoring during sunny and windy days because the AI still isn't properly configured to manage output. Just trying to make Kieran feel better because she lives above? Anzu retrieved a few manuals lying around the room. Let's just look at the things with our own eyes and see if we can spot anything odd. Director, could you go get a spare device from the locker room and sync up with us? And why would I do that? Why? Because we're going to need you to handle the control room. I don't have the qualifications for this. Why can't one of you stay behind while the other goes in? Tara and Anzu stared at the director, unable to believe their ears. We can't, sir. And why not? Anzu huffed and put her hands on her hips. Are you kidding me? All that talk about you being our boss, and you don't know the first thing about what we actually do. We can't go alone. That's against protocol. It's unsafe. This is an emergency. You can ignore protocol. If we ignore protocol, someone could get injured or fall to their death, sir. The three continued to bicker about who should do what. Kieran, who had been wandering around near them, stopped and listened to them for a bit. Once she'd heard enough, she spoke up. I'll go. Kieran! Kieran, you can't do that! Why not? Again, Kieran tilted her head as Anzu and Tara held up their hands like Kieran was going to wander into the reactor all by herself, unprotected. I saw some suits like yours in the locker room we passed by. I can just wear that and go with one of you, right? Then the other one can do the control stuff, right? It wasn't a bad idea. All one partner had to do was act as a spotter while the other operated machinery and dove underwater. 
Anybody could do it as long as they knew what to look for, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. With that in mind, Tara and Anzu glanced at the director, unimpressed. He immediately crossed his arms and griped like a stubborn teenager. Well now, don't look at me. I'm the last person here who needs to be put in danger. Without me, the island would be in shambles. Sure, buddy. They decided not to pick her any further. Nothing would be gained from wasting more time trying to get the director to do anything. Tara took Kieran's hand once more and led her into the locker room. All right, Kieran, let's, let me uh, get you in a suit, okay? Some time passed. Kieran was suited up and a plan was made. Tara and Kieran both stood by one of the doors to the reactor halls, their jackets in sealed mode. Anzu was flipping through an operational manual she found sitting on the head operator's desk as the director idled beside her. Are you two ready? Yep. Kieran began opening the door manually as she was taught, making only a gap big enough for her and Tara to squeeze through. All right, remember to tell me which areas you're in so I can monitor you, Tara. I'm only turning on two cameras at a time. Yikes, I thought you were going to do three. I changed my mind. We don't know how long this is going to take, so I'd like to use the least amount of power possible. Well, okay. The door's open. Good luck. Okay. Kieran, remember that I can't check anything underwater, so be sure to watch Tara carefully when she dives. Okay. Tara and Kieran disappeared into the hallway. At first, their steps were rather cautious. Tara didn't want to let go of Kieran's hand. The silence from the lack of turbine noise resulted in a lot of echo. 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 <laughs> Nervous thoughts flitted around in Tara's mind. She was able to stuff them down for the most part, but now that they were actually given quiet time, she couldn't help but worry herself sick. What was going on? The whole situation was suspicious. Even the director was acting strangely. And here she was. Leaving, leading her beloved childhood friend to what could possibly have been her doom. Tara didn't want to think about it. She opened her mouth to crack a joke. <laughs> this is already a little creepy, isn't it? Definitely a lot worse than those scary stories I was going to tell. I think getting trapped in a supernatural world can't compare to getting trapped for real. Oh, you think so? Hmm. This island is out in the middle of nowhere. So if we don't turn the lights back on and everybody's phones die at the same time, we might all die. <laughs> please don't say that no so nonchalantly, please. Kieran didn't say anything else terrifying. Instead, she glanced down at a hallway as they passed by it. Where are we going again? This is the hallway that leads to Reactor 4. Hence the big number 4 on the door we went through and the door down there. To put it simply, this place is designed like a big old spider web. There's four main hallways to the reactors, as well as a bunch of connecting hallways that link everything together. There's even hallways that lead to the hallways that connect the reactors. We can get from place to place very quickly like this. Huh. As they walked further into the hallway, Tara noticed small bits of teal webbing growing along pipes and crannies. She blinked a few times, thinking she was going crazy, but they remained. What the hell? Radioactive spiders? I just want to make a comparison to spiderwebs, too. That's a story to tell our neighbors. She glanced at Kieran to see if Kieran noticed it, too, but Kieran only looked at her with a tilt of her head. Tara shook off feelings of dread. They were almost to the reactor, anyways. Hey, Tara? Huh? Why did you decide to be a plant maintenance worker? That's a great question! The answer is that they decided it for me. They did? Yeah. And where do they put the plants in here? Okay, so... Alright, so I, I, we're going to have to start at the beginning here. I see a couple <laughs> of misconceptions right right off the bat. <laughs> you don't actually need any qualifications for most of the jobs in the other. You just need training. In the case of plant jobs, you get on-site training, but you're usually doing the other odd jobs because the SMRs don't require much maintenance. Having a fancy, relevant degree will help a little, but your desperation helps even more. Desperation... A small weight formed in Tara's chest. The webbing growed brighter. Yeah, desperation. I applied for all the no-qualification jobs here until I got something because I didn't want to risk living through another year of flooding and heat. That was it. I beefed up my applications with a bunch of nonsense about my attention to detail, talked out of my arse about the, for the teller interview, and I guess it worked out. 
Is it the same for Anzu? Yeah, she's from Marseille. She lost her old parents and grandma to heat stroke one after another. Just like you and me. Moving anywhere else was too expensive. This was the only option she had left. I wouldn't be surprised if they were so tuckered out processing our applications that they just gave us random positions and called it a day. That's horrible. Yeah, HR was probably sick of us, but we got no regrets. No, not you. I think the people who run this place are horrible. They must have only picked the most desperate people, because you wouldn't kick up a fuss if conditions were bad. You just wanted to be safe. <sighs> Neither of them spoke for a while. As Terra informed Anzu of their location and of the radioactivity levels in the area, Anzu flipped cameras on and off as needed. The director tapped his foot and began to pace. Well, this is just ridiculous. What would cause everyone to just disappear into a puff of smoke? He glanced at Anzu, who didn't respond. The director narrowed his eyes in suspicion as he watched her work. She was focused, too focused, for him at least. He pretended to check things scattered along the floor as he crept up to her. Tara and Kieran finally reached the end of the hall. The corners of the door were covered in webbing. The radiation readings on the multi-purpose devices reached a certain threshold, setting off a short alert sound. Oddly enough, however, they suddenly lowered again. Strange. Are they supposed to do that? No, not at all. Tara hesitated with her hand over her device's call button before ultimately deciding to refrain. All right, Kieran, let's get ready. Okay, I'll open the door. I'll get on the floor. Everybody walk the dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you certain I don't <laughs> mind doing it? Yes, it's fun. Kieran pumped her fists and moved to spin the manual manual release crank. Wait just a moment. Kieran stopped mid-spin, freezing in place like a toy drained of batteries. It made Tara snort, alleviating some of her tension. <coughs> she pushed her multi-purpose device closer to herself through the hood and spoke. Ansu, we're heading into Sector 4. Can you check and make sure that there are no zombies in there? Don't say that. <laughs> Changing the cameras. Anzu tapped a button, then another, then another. She made sure that nothing was wrong with what she could see. If she could see the parts that truly mattered, it would have been a lifesaver, but she had no choice but to hope nothing's off like this. Hmm. Huh? Something caught the director's eye, but not Anzu's. There was a bright glow coming from the bottom corner of every Reactor 4 camera. Anzu's lack of reaction made the director's fingers twitch. Okay, you two, it's all clear. Love ya. Kieran immediately began cranking the door open again. Give me some other ones to open. I can do this all day. I'll open them up like it's nobody's business. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at this gun show. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Your, yours was better. <laughs> You kidding? I live for this archetype. It's a good one. I'm bad at acting it, okay? <laughs> You're I'm doing your best, and that's it. what matters here. No, it's not. Kieran My best walked... is not enough. <laughs> I hope you don't really feel that way. <laughs> Kieran walked out onto the metal walkway before them and took in the sights. The reactor was a massive compared to the control room and the connected hallways. If their voices weren't muffled by the radiation-resistant materials between their bodies and the open air, they probably would have properly echoed. A bright teal glow radiated from the bottom of the pool. Terra, it was so bright that keeping her flashlight on wasn't necessary. Those are incredibly bright emergency lights. Huh? Why did she turn off her flashlight? The director scoffed. Are you blind? Anzu gasped. Don't sneak up behind me like that. Oh, relax now. Kieran leaned over the railing to observe the depth of the shielding pool, only to back up and dizzied by how far down everything was. What's all this? It's huge. This is just one of four reactors. Tara pointed to their left and right at massive casks shielded behind water, lead glass, and bullet-resistant plexiglass, almost completely submerged by the massive shielding pool. These things over here are the small modular reactors. Those aren't small at all. You should see these things daddies if you think they aren't small. Over there are some machines we use for maintenance, and then way far down there is a tube that leads to fuel disposal, which is yet to be used. We've yet to even complete the first ever refueling. Huh. 
Hmm? Tara, is your flashlight not working? Huh? It's bright enough to see in here without it, isn't it? Kieran hesitated. She looked at Tara like she had gone insane. Did I say something weird? It's not like I've been in here a lot like you or anything, so I'm just going to leave mine on. A pit of dread settled in Tara's stomach, but she once again stuffed down her unease and smiled. Tara led Kieran further down the walkway, reaching the crossing point. I'm going to be using that contraption over there to dive and inspect the reactors as best I can. While I do that, you'll watch me, and I'll tell you if anything is going awry. All right? Got it. Tara went to the left, with Kieran following behind her until Tara reached the platform. Watch your step, okay? Stay on the walkway. Tara pressed a button on the platform's control panel. In a flash, two halves of the lead glass shield popped up and domed the platform. She held down a button to send it downwards. Kieran watched her descend with awe. Whoa. Great job. Great to see you're learning. You're learning. When Tara looked up and saw Kieran's face, she smiled before continuing down. As soon as Kieran couldn't see her anymore, though, Tara got serious. Like I'm going to make Kieran get more involved than she already than she already is. Just stay up there for me, all right? I'll fix this all by myself, and then we'll demand a break and cuddle. The platform turned diving capsule dove into the water. Something tickled Tara's skin. She stopped abruptly, slapping the back of her neck in shock. What was that? Ignoring it, Tara continued. She took her finger off the button for down and then held... What? Oh, I thought you said something. My bad. Just hearing noises now. There was a noise in game. Oh, maybe that was it. She took her finger off the button for down, then held down the one for forwards. Now, how do I control this again? Is it down, down, up? No, it's up, up, down, <laughs> down, left, right, left. Something giggled in her left ear. What? Tara looked to her left and then her right. She hadn't realized it until then, but she'd been sweating so much it was pooling uncomfortably in her suit. It felt like she was trapped in a sauna. With quivering hands, Tara continued bringing the capsule closer to the glass, one agonizing button hold after another. The radiation fluctuated again, making her device beep at her angrily. This thing had better not be leaking. At last, she reached the SMRs. At first, she thought nothing out of the ordinary was going on until she noticed the same eerie teal webs growing around them in some spots. What's going on in there? Hmm... Kieran followed Tara with her eyes, and then with her body as she moved further left. She was so preoccupied with keeping up with Tara that Kieran almost fell when the railing abruptly stopped. There was a section cut out for ladder access a few meters away from the maintenance crane. The spent fuel pool was nearly close enough to be peeked into. Curious, Kieran walked a little further. Hmm. When she did, something caught her eye. She fumbled with the device and pointed her flashlight at the pool. The director grimaced, tugging at a rare, loosed strand on his suit. He shook his head. This was the fifth time he'd heard that obnoxious giggling. Anzu was following Kieran as best she could. Be a little more careful, please. When the director saw Anzu smile in exasperation at the screen, he sighed loudly to catch her attention. Of course it worked. Ah! What's wrong with you? I could ask you the same thing, young lady. Why do you think this is so damn amusing? Tara started to bring the capsule back up. How was she supposed to explain that to Anzu? Strange, glowing webbing on a nuclear reactor was a sci-fi trope, not a real-world problem. Still, Tara couldn't deny that she was seeing it. The weird radioactivity spikes were also of some concern. The capsule broke the water surface and emerged. Tara was now situated right next to the spent fuel pool at the farthest corner of the shielding pool. The what? Next to the what? The shielding pool? No, 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 the the earlier one. The farthest corner of the shield? No, 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 no. Okay, lost the moment. Right next to the spent fuel pool? The what? The spent fuel? <laughs> <laughs> is that... Is that is this, is the spent fuel? Is that what you want me to say? I don't know. It doesn't have quite the same ring to it. It's all right. It's all right. You, you've, you've done better. For a moment, she brought the shield down. Being trapped in that little glass world was so oppressive, she needed a breather. Tara leaned on the platform railing inside. 
Suddenly, a splash of water hit her. What in the... She noticed something out of the corner of her eye, deep in the spent fuel pool. The spent fuel. At first, she thought her eyes were playing tricks on her. But the longer she stared, the more she realized that what she saw was very real. All of the blood in her face drained elsewhere. There were bodies at the bottom of the pool. And wrapped around them like webbing were ghostly teal creatures with little faces. <laughs> they wiggled. They pulled themselves together into a ball and rapidly came up to the surface. Terra couldn't move. A small bit of the sphere pulled itself into a thin, bony strand which waved back and forth as if it were saying hello. A bubble gradually traveled up the stump until it reached the end, then shaped into a hand. Wah, 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 ha, ha, ha. All of Terra's thoughts ended there. The faces grinned from ear to ear when they locked eyes with her. Uh, uh. And then they giggled familiarly. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Terra barely eked out a scream from her closed throat. She ran back over to the control panel and slammed her palm down on the backwards button. It did not move. What? She looked back. One of the creatures had wrapped itself around a joint in the platform's mechanical arm and jammed it. She continued pressing the buttons over and over as if that would change things. No, 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 please! The other creatures amassed into a wriggling form and climbed over the pool divider toward Terra. Why? 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 They whispered in her ears. Terra nearly fainted. It could have been us. We wanted to leave. We were going to die. Why? 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 Why was her life more important than ours? Stop, stop, stop! I'm sorry, I'm sorry! Terra scrambled to the other side of the platform to no avail. The creatures lurched out and grabbed her arm and then dragged her toward the spent fuel pool. The spent fuel. <laughs> she wrestled out of their grip with all of her might. When she let, felt her arm slip out of their grasp, Terra still tipped over and fell onto the divider and then tumbled into the pool. She rushed to swim out as they split up and reformed into a flatter form, intending to fly after her like a stingray. Terra briefly managed to get out, throw herself over to the divider, and then swim through the shielding pool over to the emergency ladder. She couldn't see where Kieran was, nor could she hear anything. All she could comprehend was the sound of her gasping and her heartbeat and the fact that she needed to get to that ladder right now. Relief washed over her so intensely when she grabbed the bar that she couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> she made her way up. Free. And then something clung to her leg. Tara was pulled down. What the hell? All Anzu could see was fr a frantic Kieran running on the walkway and the top of Tara's head as she struggled to climb up the ladder. Anzu moved to contact Tara to ask what happened. Suddenly, she was up in the air. Her head slammed against the camera feeds as she was lifted up by her neck. The director glared at her with a crazed look in his eyes. A couple more cameras were turned on in the scuffle. You fucking bitch. You tell me what's going on. You know something about all this, don't you? Anzu struggled to respond due to the pain. How would I know anything? Let me go. Do you want the power to be out forever? I don't, but I'm certain that you do. What are you talking about? You think I don't know what goes on down here just because I live at the very tippy top? I've got ears everywhere, woman. You two and some of the others that work in the plant have been making a lot of buddies around here. You all know just about everyone below sea level now, don't you? Of course we do. We live and work here. Don't give me that excuse. Most people don't get to know everyone in their neighborhood in such a short amount of time. What planet do you live on? You're pissing me off, Yank. 
The director ignored Anzu's insults, pressing his palm into her neck harder for a moment to silence her. Uh, I've always been on high alert because it's not like you'd be the first ones to take over an Aqua City. Shutting off the power, I understood, but this special effects party is a bit much. Telling me all about the bad things I've done, like you're writing me a little open letter on a social media website? Are you fucking kidding me? I guess I should have expected as much from idiots who can't even get guns for this shit. A module on an accidentally activated screen suddenly rose rapidly, warning that the heat signature coming from the SMRs was very high. Terra saw the ceiling of the reactor room and all of the pipes leading elsewhere, the ghastly glow reflecting off of them from even so far away. The whispers echoed and rattled around in her skull. They almost seemed to resemble an oncoming ocean tide. <laughs> That's funny. That, that makes sense. This is fine. The hands that pulled her closer and closer were both scorching hot and freezing cold. She heard a baby crying. I'm sorry. I had no choice isn't an excuse, is it? Her world began to fade out. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really a... Uh... Tara's freefall was stopped. Tara! Kieran? Kieran held on with all her strength. Her grip on Tara's hand was iron strong. She grunted in pain, grimacing so hard her teeth looked like they were going to crack from the force. Tara felt her start to slide about. Slide a bit. K K Kieran, d don't! Kieran shook her head as if knowing what Tara was going to say. Slowly, she began to fight against the strange, unseen force that seemed to be pulling Tara away from her. For all she knew, the heaviness must have been what it was really like to save someone from falling. The radioactivity indicator on their devices fluctuated and set off an alarm again. At the same time, the grip of the ghost became much stronger. Ah! They pulled Tara with everything they had. Anzu tried to wriggle it out of the director's grasp. She wasn't going to try and debate his wild conspiracy theories while he threatened to crush her windpipe. But he was too strong. The director grimaced as he stared down at Anzu. Come on now, you're a smart girl. I'm sure you understand it's better to tell me how to stop this shit than it is to keep fighting. He moved, to, he moved his shoulder a little to set, let her see the interior of his jacket. There was a pistol strapped to it. This island counts as its own nation. As stated in your contract, you forfeited the rights you had in your country of origin the moment you stepped foot on our soil. I don't know anything. You're not going to gain anything threatening me like this. The director gave her a blank look, radiating quiet rage. I've had enough of your bullshit. He threw her to the side. Anzu's head hit the edge of the control panel at a dangerous angle before she fell to the ground. The director waited a few moments. Then, when Anzu remained motionless, he glanced at the cameras and pulled out his gun. I'll just take care of the rest of them on my own. From his pocket, he pulled out a microtransceiver and spoke into it. Get down here. Immediately. Kieran slid even further. Tara shivered. Please, please, Kieran, we're both, we're both done for if you don't let go. I won't. Suddenly, she slowly felt the strength of the hands begin to diminish. The radioactivity levels were going back down, inconsistent as always. Let go. All at once, the creatures let go. Ah. Uh, the sudden lightning of her load caused Kieran to pull Tara up. <coughs> Pardon me. The sudden lightning of her load caused Kieran to pull Tara up like she was popping her out of an unseen hole. Ah. The two scrambled up into a sitting position on the walkway. Kieran relaxed and gasped for air. Tara, however, was still on high alert. She looked down. There, the creatures were gathering again and climbing up the ladder like a massive teal cloud. Shit, 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 shit! Kieran, Kieran, come on, let's go! Huh? But... Just, just trust me, okay? Tara took Kieran's hand to help her stand, and she ran as fast as possible in the direction of the closest of the hallways. The creatures made it up to the walkway. Kieran, help me quick! O okay. The two cranked open the door as fast as possible. As the creatures came closer, they began to laugh. Tara smiled with relief when the door opened wide enough for them to squeeze through. Yes! Tara dragged Kieran through the open door. 
Without saying a word, she whirled around to shut the door again. It closed right on the advancing things, which giggled all the way up until they were cut off. Tara hadn't realized she was holding her breath until she locked the door shut completely. She gasped for air, but it didn't stop there. Without another word, she grabbed Kieran's hand again and ran. As soon as they reached the door, she'd open it with mad strength and speed. Tara? She could still hear it. The wailing cries, the anger. It hammered away at her skull and threatened to crush her mind. The farther away they got, the quieter the voices became. Soon, she managed to find a hallway that was dead silent, and she let go of Kieran at the last, at last, and braced her tired body against the wall. <sighs> Tara? Kieran reached out to touch her girlfriend's shoulder. As soon as her hand made contact, Tara screamed and whirled around, pressing herself up against the wall that cornered prey. Ah! 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 Sorry. Ah. Tara finally lost strength in her legs and slowly slid down onto the floor. She brought her knees up to her shoulders and squeezed them. Kieran hesitated. Gradually, as not to frighten Tara again, she sat down next to her. Tara, what happened? Tara looked at Kieran for a moment. She couldn't see them? How do I even explain it? I don't want to explain it. I just want to pretend it never happened. Go back up, shut my eyes, and let everyone else deal with the problem. There were corpses. I know. I saw. Tara nodded with pursed lips. Then surely that meant everyone in there was all really dead. She paused for a moment of silence for her co-workers, then continued. There was also something in there with them. Something? I don't know what it was, but they were like big teal blobs with faces burned into them. They were talking to me like, like they were angry. They kept saying that it could have been them. They kept asking me why. Why? Tara. Kieran? Tara's voice was both resolute and defeated. <sighs> you didn't win the lottery by chance. I, I used something called a priority coupon. It means I stole a chance to survive away from someone for your sake. Hmm. Hmm. The abandoned control room was still. The quiet hum of the electronics was the only sound that filled the room. Camera feeds would blink in and out at random, nobody there to watch them. Suddenly, the stillness was interrupted by a single person struggling to stand. She gripped the edge of the control panel and brought herself up, all while pressing her other hand against the gash in her head. Piece of shit. Good for nothing, Yank? Drops of blood dribbled down her face and pitter-pattered all over the floor. Damn it, this is going to need stitches. Anzu dizzily looked up at the cameras without any clear in direction in her mind. When she saw the reactor was devoid of people, her mind was thrown back into action. Oh hell, where are they? She frantically started to cycle through the cameras. A beeping noise interrupted her. She looked behind her to see a display at the end at the head operator's desk lit up. Anzu walked over to see what was making the sound. The director of energy was calling. Ah! Anzu answered immediately. The director of energy's exhausted face was projected onto the screen, her room shrouded in darkness. Hey. Her brows raised in surprise. You don't look like Jimbo. In fact, I'd say you look like Anzu. Her eyes went wide when she noticed Anzu's gash. Why are you bleeding, sweetheart? What happened? I don't have a lot of time to explain. The director's lost his mind and people are missing. What the? Oh, you've got to be fucking kidding me. That shithead didn't say a bloody thing to me. I learned all about this nonsense when the lack of climate control in my room woke me up. Well, I'm just glad someone answered. Look. Electricity worked their magic and repaired some wires that got chewed through by... Oh, I don't know. Looked like mice, but for whatever reason, we got no energy reserved. One of our men is saying it was a fault with the design. And do you need me to do something here? Antu glanced nervously at the camera feeds. 
Yes, we need you to turn the reactors back on to generate energy. The director of energy looked at a screen in her room, presumably something like a laptop. They're all off, according to the diagnostic I have here. Two of the rooms, because they obviously were on standby for refuel, and the other two are automatically scrammed themselves. You just need to switch on the scrammed ones. I'll walk you through it, darling. You don't need to worry about a thing. Okay. Give me a moment, though. Anzu ran over to the cameras as quickly as she could and flipped them on until she found out where everyone was. She pressed the call button on her device. With a fraction of crushing weight off of her shoulders, Tara leaned her head against the wall as her heart swirled in discomfort. Kieran hadn't said a word. She rubbed her wrist like she was trying to get something off of them. Tara's parched throat made her voice croak. Do you hate me, Kieran? No. Kieran's reply was immediate. Like I said, I think this place is horrible. You did something. Hmm. <laughs> you can say awful. I won't blame you. It's a little awful. See? But I think deciding who lives at random is even more awful. So, so much more awful than some people desperately trying to save their loved ones. In fact, I doubt you're the only one who resorted to this. And besides, even if you hadn't done it, an unfeeling computer might have randomly generated a number to let me in and have someone else suffer anyhow. <sighs> the people who run these islands and the world leaders that agreed to this are at fault. So many people who could have prevented this chose not to. You're just one person. <sighs> I guess... Silence zoomed over them for a few moments. Tara turned her head, so she was looking off into the distance at the end of the hall. I'm gonna have to tell Lanzu. I can't hide it forever, and she'll hate me. Kirin chose her words carefully before speaking. She and I are friends, but I don't know her as well as you, so I can't say if she'll hate you or not. And I don't really think whether or not she'll hate you is what you should be worried about. If you think she has the right to know, then you should tell her. Tara weakly turned her head again and smiled at Kieran Riley. I don't want her to think I'm a bad person. I'm just, I'm just scared. If it were me, I'd want her to know so the secrecy doesn't crush me. And she's smart. She'd probably find out eventually. It'd be better if you told her on your own terms. Tara threw her head down and cried out. Ah! The words of the creatures flashed through her mind. I'm scared pathetic reason to be scared. Am I a child? Is this really what matters right now? At that moment, the speaker of her communication device crackled, startling her. Bonsoir, ladies. Can you hear me? Tara's mouth went dry. She couldn't speak. Ansu, there's a problem. Kieran leaned in and covered for Tara. What a coincidence. I have some bad news, too. You sound out of breath. It's related to what I'm about to tell you. The director is coming for you all, and granted I wasn't seeing things, I think he has a gun. What? The news was enough to snap Tara out of it. Fucking bastard! What happened? To put it simply, he let some conspiracy theories of his get to his head. Right now, he's a few halls away and moving backward from your position. So he's not that big of a concern at the moment, but it's important we hurry and do what we need to do and then leave. What is it we need to do exactly? The Director of Energy is on a call with me right now. I'm going to turn on the reactors, but I need to know if there was anything you saw out there that was unusual or concerning. Tara and Kieran went quiet. Hello? If I tell Anzu of all people about the ghosts, I want to be very productive, I don't think. But... There's been some strange activity in Reactor 4. I think there was an accident. An accident? Not a big one. Everything looked safe and fine. The radioactivity was just a little weird. It would spike and then go down. Hmm. Must be because of the refueling that happened today. And the dead people. Could you repeat that? A bunch of people fell into one of those pools and died. Kieran looked devastated. She must not have liked the idea of concealing that fact. It wasn't like it would have been hidden forever anyways. They sunk to the bottom of the spent fuel pool. Everyone who was on shift earlier, all of them. Hmm. Tara and Kieran could hear Anzu curse and kick something over the speaker. And then her movements abruptly stopped. 
Get out of there. Anzu sounded like she was holding her device too close to her mouth. What? The barrel of the director's pistol smoked. Looks like I missed. Both Kieran and Terrace scrambled to stand. <laughs> so I was right. I don't know what your group stands to gain from sabotaging the electricity and killing workers. Are you suicidal? This island can barely operate without power. Imagine if we were at risk of running aground without a way to steer it. Or if it were raining without the system to shield the city and pump excess water out into the ocean. Or is it that you want to tank the company's reputation with some fake malfunction? Who do you work for? Who paid you all to do this? You know you're just another in another rich guy's pockets, right? The women didn't even know how to respond. They only had two options, fight or run. Neither of them had a weapon of their own, so fighting was out of the question. Trying to run would, res would result in getting shot. Are you going to answer me or not? If you don't want to, then I'll just go get the answer from the bitch with the escalator bangs. I heard you. I know you're still alive. Anzu let out the breath she was holding. She had kept her connection open to listen. She continued to do so, unwilling to leave Terra and Kieran all alone. Additionally, she wanted the Director of Energy to hear everything. Anzu wasn't sure what she'd be able to do, but she hoped it would be something. The director came closer. Terra and Kieran still didn't move. With the way that he was now, making sudden moves would probably make his trigger finger itch. Terra wondered if staying still was a mistake, because now he was within point-blank range. <sighs> I guess I'm not getting my answer now. Well, yippee ki yay motherfucker. In the fraction of a second before the director pulled the trigger, time slowed to a crawl. Kieran reached down to grip Terra's hand, preparing to run away. But Terra's eyes focused on the gun and only the gun. The director continued to hold it single-handedly with his arms stretched out all the way, even in such close quarters. My leg can probably reach it from this distance if I can kick it. I... No, this is too risky. His finger moved. Who was he going to shoot first? Terra or Kieran? Terra imagined what it would look like if Kieran, who Terra had sacrificed other lives to secure the future of, lost her life as well. Tara would continue to continue her dreary job with even more guilt clouding her heart. The memory of her beloved's horrible death would never stop replaying. There would be no more Kieran. No more adorable little odd faces. No more shy touches to get Tara's attention. No more silly jokes and out-of-place snickers. The girl who brought color to little Tara's world when she smiled at her during Utarayan kite flying would be gone. Forever. What would be the point in living anymore? <sighs> Tara made her decision. Not a chance in hell! She swung her leg in an arc with everything she had. Not used to kicking like that in any capacity. Tara stretched her muscle too far and winced in pain as her foot connected with the barrel of the gun. It went flying away, torn out of the director's hand. What the hell? Let's go! Get fucked. The two women made a break for it. Though the path back to the control room was open, Terra didn't run towards it. Are you two okay? I should have had you both come back first. I'll track him for you. Forget about us. You have to turn on the reactor, right? We'll distract him, so hurry up and do it. That doesn't matter right now. I'm afraid it does. Unzu whirled around to look at the display on the head operator's desk. The director of energy sounded as if she was heading down the emergency stairwell. Anzu couldn't see her face anymore. She seemed to be carrying her phone in her pocket, but her voice had a grave tone. Security won't listen to me. They're all the Yank director's personal dogs, so they'll do whatever he says. Seems like he's distrusted me for a long time. However, they're not stupid dogs. If you feed them bullshit about how the reactor will blow to smithereens, if you don't follow my instructions to the letter, I can keep you from looking like Swiss cheese. Why would that happen? Because they're coming for him. Anzu's stomach dropped. Hurry, Anzu. Turn on all the displays behind this desk and start up the process for Reactor 3. She obeyed. When they turned a corner, Kieran stopped, her breath hitching. Kieran! Look. 
Masses of the creatures from the reactor gathered into formless blobs, poking out of nooks and crannies of the hall and small gaps in the pipes. They made the same familiar wail Terra and Anzu had heard before the power went out. Kieran, you can see them now? Ah, oh, shit! The director, who just turned into the hallway behind them, shot at the creature several times. Kieran and Terra were left with no choice but to run, leaping over the creatures. They reached out and tried to grab at the woman, to no avail. Kieran only started seeing them after I told her the truth about her lottery win. And if the director can see them too... The realization hit Terra like a freight train and snapped her into anger. That bastard! He knows what he's done and he still treats us like all this! Security guards burst into the control room. Now stop right there. Where's the director? Anzu didn't even budge or respond as she listened to the director of energy's instructions, jumping back and forth between touch screens. She had to take on every position at once. She had no choice. A gun was pointed at her. I said stop. Shut up. What did you just say to me? I said shut up. We're fixing it. If you want to me to stop and watch this whole island become floating Chernobyl, be my guest. The guard put his finger on the trigger. You bitch. Wait, wait, wait. She's telling the truth. Look. The aggressive security guard listened to his co-worker and turned his attention to the displays. Though he didn't know the jargon rapidly appearing on the screens, he could tell that something was turning on, and it had to do with coolant control. Regardless, he made a gesture, and several guards aimed at Anzu. You'd better keep turning it on, or there'll be problems. And when you're done, you'll tell us where the director is. <sighs> Fine by me. The director of energy only continued to calmly recite instructions to Anzu, unperturbed by the behavior of security. Kieran, now in the lead, turned down a random hallway. Where the hell are you going? No bloody clue. I just want to get away. Kieran looked around wildly as they ran, dodging every creature that appeared more than she needed to. Exhaustion from all of the intensive physical activity was starting to take its toll on the both of them. If they dared to rest for even a moment, they would be done for. We're going in circles. He might get clever and try to go backwards or cut us off if we keep this up. Then what else do we do? Terra hesitated. I say we make a break for the reactor, open and close it as fast as we can together, then go to one of the other halls connected to it. The director will have to manually open and close too, all by himself, for a man as big as him. He'll be slow. Okay. A gunshot rang down from the hall. Terra looked back to see the director running after them, aiming wildly. I'm afraid the real world doesn't look like your country's action films. Hup. Kieran dove through the connecting hall in the middle as another gunshot sounded. This time it hit a nearby pipe that began spraying hard water. Kieran and Terra managed to duck under it while the director was assaulted by its force. Ah, oh, shit! That's what you get. To reach the door to Reactor 2, when Terra reached out to use the manual release, the door opened by itself. Shit, it's already coming back on? Onzu's too fast. Should we go back? Before Terra could answer Kieran's question, a bullet whizzed right past them. The director, soaking wet and breathing heavily, was already in the hallway. No, no, definitely not. This time Terra took the lead, pulling Kieran along into the reactor room. The SMRs were humming with life. The turbines were quickly speeding up. Terra and Kieran tried to ignore the creatures climbing up the ladders and along the walkway, moving out of their way if need be. The room was rapidly heating up. Is this safe? It won't get dangerously hot all the way over here. Terra briefly looked back at the director. He suddenly stopped, fell to his knees, and threw up a strange, grayish dreck. <laughs> the creatures gradually made their way towards him. Something tells me those ghostly things aren't safe to be around unprotected, though. Hands reached out and brushed against the girls' suits. Every step came with pain, especially for Terra. Neither were sure how they were able to keep running. But as the lights in the room flickered on and the turbines reached their maximum speed, Terra and Kieran made it to the connecting hallway. The door slid shut quickly, behind them, and locked automatically. And immediately, they collapsed in relief and exhaustion. It's on. Good work, sweetheart. 
Anzu searched for Terra and Kieran on the cameras. When she saw them sitting together in a corridor, she breathed a sigh of relief. Her smell disappeared when the rifle's barrel was pressed against the back of her head. Now where's the director? He ran off on his own into the reactors. What? Oh, look! One of the security guards pointed at a camera feed with a shaky hand. There was the director, throwing up violently in Reactor 2 as he swatted at the creatures gathering around him fretfully. What the hell are those? Quit your complaining! I got myself here with effort! I got here fair and sp- Oh god, make it- Make it stop, please! I'm- As he vomited more 3D printed food onto the walkway, the creatures managed to envelop his leg. No! Get away from me! Let me go! His disoriented cries resembled the ranting of a drunkard. <laughs> we hate so many people, but you, we hate you the most. The director was torn off the walkway and sent flying down. The walkway camera suddenly went out. Everyone in the control room followed where he went on the other feeds. They watched as he was dragged like a ragdoll, far down with a splash, into the corpse-filled, spent fuel pool. The creatures disappeared. When the walkway feed came back on, there was no trace of anything having been there, not even the director's vomit puddle. The room was silent. And then Anzu pitched back and collapsed. Probably due to the head wound. <laughs> In the corridor, Terra and Kieran pressed their heads together as they cooled down. Terra nuzzled her head against Kieran's before speaking. I'll tell Anzu everything. Are you sure? I'm sure. She stared at her gloved hands. Telling Anzu won't fix anything about this rotten system. But I don't just like pretending either. I'm tired of pretending everything is all right. I don't want to keep avoiding eggshells my whole life. Heh. <laughs> Kieran smiled sweetly up at Terra, who hadn't realized she stood up all while talking. Uh, huh? What, what's so funny? I wasn't trying to crack a joke this time. Hmm. It's nothing. Kieran stood up too. Let's go. Yeah. The unusual deaths were covered up with great speed. Replacements for all the opened positions, including the directors, had been quickly, quietly shuffled in. Their sudden absences were recorded as transfers to unfinished cities. The rest of the committee, interested in keeping their jobs and their lives, only reported half-truth to Deveratech HQ and handled the rest on their own. Had it not been for the Director of Energy, the one with the full administrative access to the damning camera footage, vouching for them, Terra, Anzu, and Kirin would have all been sent to other Aqua Cities. Of course, they were still sworn to secrecy. It is not as if they could figure out how to tell people what happened without sounding crazy anyways, or so the Director of Energy's argument went. It took two weeks for them to finally be able to speak to each other again. Terra kept putting off speaking to Anzu not out of cowardice, but to ensure that Anzu wouldn't collapse from additional stress. That and Terra and Kieran both found themselves busy with routine radiation sickness monitoring. When Terra finally told Anzu, the sound of a slap seemed to resound throughout the under. Anzu walked away with that day uncaring of the eyes on them. Terra had no choice but to sleep at Kieran's apartment for a few days. The two found themselves at one of the city's piers during a midnight stroll, without their phones so they could enjoy their time uninterrupted, all the while Terra occasionally nursed her cheek. The mark is gone. Why are you still doing that? Sure, the pain is gone, but it doesn't change the fact that my heart still hurts. Duh! <laughs> When we're done getting checkups, I'll have to go back to working and living with her. Never let me shag a company-assigned roommate ever again. Okay, I'll try. You're kind of insatiable, though, so I don't know if I can. What? What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> oh, you, 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 Mom P. Kieran's cheeks flared hot at the sound of her doc nom. Hey, that was low. <laughs> you left me no choice. Kieran reached out and started pinching Terra's cheeks. 
Oh, the lingering pain in my heart. The lingering pain. Boo. Boo. You lout. I see you two have been having a wonderful time without me. Tara nearly leapt right into the ocean out of survival instinct. <laughs> Hi, Anzu. Good evening. It's a good thing I'm still on pleasant terms with Kieran, or I never would have been able to find you, Tara. K K Kieran, you told her where we were? Yeah. So that was the important message you had to send before we left. <gasps> you traitor! <laughs> you can't run away, Tara. The grin plastered on Anzu's face was concerning, but there wasn't a hint of upset in her words or actions. Tara stopped cowering when she realized this. You aren't mad at me? Oh, don't get it mixed up. I'm still very displeased with you. I've cooled off about the coupon thing, but I still can't stand that you hid something like that from me. I still think it's better we take a break for now. Tara wilted. And why did you come? I came here to ask for your help. My help? Tara glanced at Kieran, who was still smiling. She gave Tara an almost excited look. Uh, what's going on? Anzu stretched with a smile, arms behind her head as she walked casually over to Tara. Wow, it's so breezy out here. The ocean air is great at night, if a bit salty. Uh, uh, Anzu? When Anzu finally closed in on Tara, she put a hand on her shoulder and spoke without looking at her, gazed focused on the horizon. Her voice was very low, as if she expected someone to overhear. We're gonna make this place ours. Huh? Anzu chuckled before continuing. That idiot gave me a pretty good idea. I thought it would be nice to make his worst fears come true as a way to remember him. I've had just about enough of feeling sick every morning, thinking about how many people might be gone because I was the one who got hired and not them. It'll be difficult to plan because of the surveillance, but Kieran and I figured out it's laxer in some areas up here. After all, they don't want the remote workers and wealthy hoppers lining their pockets complaining. The demographic is too privacy savvy to trick them. S seriously? Seriously. Anzu backed up and placed both of her hands on Tara's shoulders. Don't you think this is better than moping about this place for the rest of your life and dying an early death from some work-related cause? Tara blinked. Kieran came up next to Anzu, then reached out and took Tara's hand gently. Let's do some crimes. <laughs> Since when have you been into crimes? <laughs> Let's make things a little less horrible, Tara. Tara hesitated. If she did this, she could say goodbye to stability and familiarity. However, the rage of the creatures and the dead bodies of her co-workers still reappearing in her nightmares tore at her heart. Anzu is a realist. She's not one for pipe dreams. And you can't really change Kieran's mind once she's settled in on something. The prospect of upending her entire life made Tara's fingertips and chest buzz with a curious feeling. It was both unpleasant and invigorating. Perhaps if she had been asked the same question before the blackout incident, she would have immediately rejected the prospect. However, Tara had changed. After all, she had just kicked a gun out of a man's hand and lived. All right, I'll join then. Yay. Anzu patted Tara's shoulders. <laughs> you did well that time. Well, for starters, we should probably make it look like I had a grander purpose coming up here. Let's go get some ice cream. Yay, undercover ice cream. See, you're good at it. <laughs> Tara watched Anzu and Kieran head off towards the city for a moment, taking in the sight of their backs. Yeah, ice cream, undercover. <laughs> Crimes, cream. Crimes, oh, that's better. <laughs> and then, with a running start, she caught up to them and threw her arms around their shoulders. The food appears pretty good, you know. I can't get enough of it. Hands off. Oh, sorry. I think I'm going to get vanilla. Me too. You know what Anzu always gets? Chocolate ghost pepper. The way she's obsessed with cold spicy things is adorable. Tara. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're just roommates now. Just, just roommates. The night continued. The lone star in the dark ocean continued to float along on its aimless path. Time marched on. In its wake, what did these women leave behind as proof they once lived? That was something for them alone to decide, and no one else. Yeah. 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 Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah! High five me! Smack that!
Oh, it doesn't show the credits this time. Cause, Damn. Because we, because we, oh. Because we already beat it. Oh, no, shit. Already, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I got you. I got you. I got you. Um, hold on. Is it in gallery? Probably. No. Liner notes? No. Is it actually under options and I just didn't see it? No. Well, you should get this game and play it yourself from the beginning so that way you can see the credit sequence. There, There's cute art in it. There's very cute art in it. And that, that you don't get to see because of this. It's probably in the gallery here, but... It's probably in the gallery here, but you know what? We're not going to show it to you. <laughs> so you have uh, to play so you it. Have to, so, you have to, so you have to go get it and play it yourself. Yeah? 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 <laughs> we had a lot of fun with this game. Um, I think it speaks to it that I still had so much fun doing this, even though we had to record some of these parts two or three times over. Yep. So I really hope that you enjoyed our time here. I know we did enjoy Gay Ghost Stories, and... Gay nope. ghosts, gay ghosts, gay ghosts. I don't think the ghosts themselves were... Well, one of them was. They can be gay if they want. Okay. That's the bird could be gay. We they... don't know. We didn't ask. Okay, that's 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 fair. Well, we'll see you all next time for something else, everyone. Bye. Peace. Smash, 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 like, comment, and subscribe.